If you have a Bible, I want you to flip over to Ephesians chapter 6. You can find it in your, the Pew Bible if you don't have one on page 920. If you don't own a Bible, feel free to take that one. As you're flipping over there, you might realize that this morning we come to the conclusion of the letter sent to the Ephesians. <clears throat> and uh, providentially has worked out that, that, that this section we're going to be focusing on prayer. And this is also the last Sunday of kind of our, our month of prayer as we've been seeking to, to grow in that and to be uh, more habitual in our prayer and consistent in those things. The text today is, is separated because some of us want to go home eventually and have lunch, so we have to break things up a little bit here. But as you'll see, is what, what, what we'll be talking about this morning is directly connected. It's, it's a flow of the same kind of theme or point that Paul has been working on since verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6, calling us, inviting us, in some ways, pleading with us to find our strength and our might in the Lord because the reality is we need that strength, we need that power, we need that, that reinforcement in our life because we have an enemy. Maybe you might even say enemies, plural, rulers, princes, authorities of the spiritual realm that are seeking to shoot blazing arrows with lies and deceptions wanting to hurt us and hoping that by wounding us or even just keeping our head down in the trenches, we will begin to doubt and, and fear and begin to believe a lie that God isn't actually for us and, and, and seek to bring division between us and God and, and us and, and other brothers and sisters in the Lord or within our families. But God hasn't abandoned us, and by grace, He has forged a glorious set of armor for us to clothe ourselves in, to, to suit up so that we would be able to stand firm against this onslaught, against this attack, and be able to do battle against this enemy. And so Paul now transitions in a way. It's, it's the same point, but he goes from the armor transitioning in a way to the strategy. How do we use the armor? What do we do in battle? What's our plan when we have to fight these spiritual forces? And so Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to be focusing specifically on verses 18 to 20, but I'm going to start in, in verse 14 to kind of remind ourselves and kind of get us in the, the thread of the passage Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that Words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, so that you may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with the love incorruptible. Tychicus is sent with this letter, and likely he's also the one who carries the letter to the, 
to the Colossians. He is sent by Paul because if you remember way, way back when we started this, Paul is in prison. <clears throat> He's in prison for the gospel. And so he is able to, to write and, and maybe smuggle out or likely he was even able to, to send these letters. And he sends it with Tychicus who, if you look at here, is praised as being a beloved brother, a faithful minister. So in some ways, as Paul is ending this letter, you can imagine this guy comes, here's the letter that Paul has for you. They would read it out loud to, to the church gathered there, and they'd come to this end, and the guy who brought them the letter, Paul is saying, he is a beloved brother and a faithful minister, meaning, i.e., he gets what this letter is about. He understands that he has a new identity in Christ, that he's been adopted by God, that he has the blessed indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He understands that God is about reconciling us to himself and to one another. He understands the mystery of the gospel. He understands how these things should be played out in your life, whether that's at home, in your marriages, with your kids, with your co-workers, with your, your slaves, your masters all these other things. He gets what it means to put on the full armor of God. He understands that warfare is going on, and he understands the strategy. That's why I sent him to you. Listen to him. And the apostle closes his letter with peace, love with faith, and grace. If you will, all of the things that the letter is, it's kind of bubbling all around and, and up in different parts throughout this letter. And so again, he's, the whole letter is about seeking peace with God and man and, and with one another, with, about having faith that, that grows love. And it's all connected to our union with Christ Jesus. That's how he ends his letter. And so we're going to pray for us, and then we're going to consider the aspect of prayer in those last couple of verses. Because if we're going to have union with Christ, if we're going to have this union with God that produces peace, that produces love, that produces the grace we need to, to continue to grow and mature and thrive, we have to commune with the one that we're united with. So let's pray. Lord, the fact that you hear us right now as we come to you in prayer is awe-inspiring. That the sovereign creator, sustainer of everything that is or was or will be has inclined his ear to hear the prayers of finite, limited, broken people. That's amazing. We have access to the God of the universe. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't diminish this and that, and, and that we would see it and we would so delight in the reality that, that we can come to you, we can come with boldness before the very throne of God and and that we would be people of prayer. That we would pray in, in all circumstances. That we would lay all things before you. And that we would understand that, that you hear us and that you commune with us as well. Grow us in this, Lord. Help us to understand that the blessing of prayer in a life filled with warfare. And the strength that's to be had when we talk with you. And that you meet our needs perfectly. Let us be humble to know that our needs aren't always met the way we desire. But you hear our prayers and you give us exactly what we need. More of you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I want us to consider God's ordained strategy for victory in spiritual warfare. Friends, 
Prayer is the strategy for victory. It's amazing how much you can find that directs you down other paths when it comes to having a life that is thriving, a life that, to overcome sin or overcome the, these spiritual warfares that seem to either not even mention the very strategy that God has given us, which is prayer. Throughout history, man's physical history, vastly superior military armies were beaten, overwhelmed, destroyed by smaller groups of people, combatants, because the larger military had a poor strategy. They didn't understand how to, to fight against even these smaller armies. And having the full armor of God, putting on all of these things that Paul has been talking about here in, the, in these closing words, if misapplied or misused, won't produce the very thing that God has desired for them to produce in our lives. They won't lead to victory. You can clothe yourself in the armor of God and then misuse that very armor. The tools, right? this armor, this, this helmet of salvation, this belt of truth, this breastplate of righteousness, the, the sword of the Spirit, they were all meant to be used in conjunction with prayer. They, they can't even be used properly if you separate them from God's strategy for warfare. I think we do that frequently because we forget prayer. Prayer, the very strategy God has given us for this battle, we toss away. And, and you can see that. It, it, perhaps if, if you ever have the opportunity, just go to your Google and you know search Armor of God, and, and you will find a list of sermons or, or things, and they, they go through all of the pieces that we were to put on, but they all seem to stop right at verse 18. Put this on, put this on, put this on, but then they never go into the strategy. Prayer is the foundation to be effective with the armor of God. Prayer is used to even clothe us with the armor of God. Sometimes we think we're putting on the armor of God because, well, I've been saved, so I have the helmet of salvation on. But are you praying, Lord, continue to save me? Continue to help me to think rightly about the new identity that I have in, in God. Do you pray those things? Because as you're praying those things, it's almost like you're, you're not just putting the helmet on, but you're, you're putting that strap on so that it doesn't get knocked off. Are you praying, Lord, help me to remember that the righteousness is your righteousness, not my righteousness, because that's keeping that, that the breastplate of righteousness on you. We, we need to be praying for the armor of God. We need to be praying to even keep it on. But prayer isn't a strategy that we only use in circum, certain circumstances or certain situations. We are to be praying in all things. Take a look at the word all in, in just one verse here. Verse 18. Listen for it. Pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. I mean, four times in a single verse, the word all is used there. We are called to pray at all times with all prayer, with all supplication, with all all perseverance for all of the saints. That's the strategy. So you've put on the armor of God. How do we apply this strategy of prayer? 
So I want to look at those four alls, and, and I want to encourage us. Here's, here's, the, here's the glorious truth here. If you're not doing this, today's the day to start. Don't beat yourself up and be like, oh, well, I, I haven't been doing that. I haven't been praying for all things here. Or maybe I pray for all of this, but I don't pray for all of that. Don't beat yourself up. There's forgiveness. There's grace. And guess what? The phone still works. So pick it up and call. And just that one little bit here, God isn't going to be on the other end saying, I just think of like my grandma. <laughs> What, well, why, why has it been so long since you've called me, Kurt? Yes, thank you notes, right? Like that, yeah, thank you for reminding me that. <laughs> you know, if, if my grandmother is in heaven, I know when I reach her there, she'll be like, it's been such a long time since I've been talking to you. Where have you been? And I'll be like, well, you've been dead, Grandma, for years. Right, like... God isn't going to be like that. He isn't going to guilt you in like, oh, it's been so long. Right? He's ready to hear you. Let's look at these alls here. Brothers and sisters, do you pray at all times? Do you heed the word of Paul, you know, to pray without ceasing? And I know sometimes we, we look at that and we're just thinking like, well, how can we pray without ceasing? You know, like we're just supposed to be mumbling prayers wherever we go. I don't think that's the point that Paul is saying there, but I think what he's trying to say is that in every circumstance, when, when something comes up, pray for it. You know, when, when you're having a conversation with someone, you may be a, a friend or a coworker, and you know it's a hard conversation, in those moments, you can be listening to what they're saying, but also be praying, Lord, give me the proper response in this situation. You know, as you're driving somewhere to, to, to do something, Lord, if you would have something to happen there that, that you want me to speak into or you want me to help someone or whatever, like just, just make me aware of that. You know, we, we pray in all of these circumstances. Do we just pray before meals or, or maybe before big, weighty decisions? We're commanded to pray in all circumstances. So in that one moment when you think, well, I don't need to pray about this, if it's something, pray about it. It should be especially true when we begin to feel that, that tension or that, that division that can creep into our lives, that, that the, the fear or doubt or, or we're seeing uh, you know, arguments or division. We should automatically respond like, hold on, let's pray. It should be our response. It should be quick to our lips. We shouldn't be so foolish to believe that we only need God's wisdom and his power and his strength and his guidance in, in big things. Because most of our life is lived out in little things. And I, I, I'm connecting a little bit here with, with a parable that Jesus says, you know, where, 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 where he kind of ends that parable and he says, if you are faithful with few things or little things, you'll be faithful with big things or, or, or great things or many things. So if we're not praying in the little circumstances, we're honestly, if you look at your life, yeah, there are some major decisions that you make in your life, but it's really just a handful of them. Think of all the little decisions in your life that have led to big decisions. I think we forget about those We need to be praying in the, in the small things, in the little things, because a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, next thing you know, you're way over here. Pray in all things. Pray in all times for all situations. And then I love this, that Paul goes on, he says, not only do we pray at all times, but we are to pray with all prayer, and, and the ESV says, and supplication, it's almost like he, Paul is saying, you know, pray in all prayers with all requests, all petitions. You could almost translate as pray with all prayers and prayers. You know, it's kind of like Paul's laying it on here. Pray. Don't just pray all situations, but pray all kinds of praying. You know, like, I think sometimes we, you know, I grew up in a church where it was, my view of prayer was, 
you had to use really long words. You know, and if, 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 if God was going to hear your prayer, you had to set, like, all of a sudden, like, dip into another language. And, 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 and I experienced this, too, when, when Lee and I, when our family, when we were living in Salt Lake, you know, praying, praying with a Mormon, you would sit and have a regular conversation, and then all of a sudden they'd be like, can we pray? And you'd be like, okay. And then I'm like, why did you just slip into the King James language as soon as you started praying? It was like, talking about God normal, and then we'd go to pray, and the Mormon person who'd be praying would be like, thou is heavenly father of the realm. Like, and I was just, who, who, who are you? And then they say amen, and they're like, what do you want to do later today? Like, what? You don't have to pray like that. I, I want to remind you again, Jesus, Jesus gives a, a, a great parable about like, the, the Pharisee who stands and he uses these great words. And then he talks about the, the tax collector who just beats his breast and he just says, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, you know, the, the, those four or five words honor God more than the eloquent vomit that falls out of the Pharisee's mouth. Pray all kinds of prayers. Maybe they're short sputters or maybe they're long conversations. Times of silent meditation on, on, on biblical truths or, or shouts of, of praise or, or pleading. Sporadically throughout the day and at specific times set aside. Maybe we, we pray the, the, the prayers, we recite the prayers that we find in the scriptures or, or that maybe the Christians before us have, have penned or we just pray what pours out of our hearts. What Paul is saying when he's saying, you know, pray with all prayers and supplication or all prayers and prayers, he's saying, use them all. Sometimes pray this way, but sometimes pray that way. Sometimes you'll feel to pray this, and sometimes you'll feel to pray that. Sometimes it will be long prayers. Sometimes it will just be silent. Sometimes it will be momentary, just like, I don't know what's going to happen. Help me. Pray all kinds of prayers. Our loving relationship, the connection that we have with our God, should drive us to commune with him. Think about it. Sometimes with a, with, a, with a closest friend, sometimes you sit there and you talk till two in the morning. And sometimes you just sit there and you, you say three words between the two of you. But because you have this relationship, you're going to continue to have those conversations. And so we should be driven to pray all kinds of prayers. We pray prayers of requests, prayers of praise, prayers of strength, prayers of guidance. We pray all kinds of prayers. I love how Paul is writing it. Pray all prayers and pray. So when you think of that moment, I don't know what to pray. Pray that. Lord, I don't know what, what I'm supposed to say here. I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. Pray those prayers. Then Paul tells us to pray with all perseverance. Do you approach the Lord once on a subject and then move on? Jesus, in Luke chapter 18, he tells the parable often titled the persistent widow to teach his disciples, keep coming to the Lord be persistent, persevere, come again and again and again. The widow is demanding justice and the judge doesn't listen to her and she comes again and again to his, his courtroom until finally the judge says, okay, I'll give you what you want. Or in Luke 11, a little bit earlier, after sharing what we call the Lord's Prayer, which interesting enough, Jesus the Lord has never recorded actually praying that, but I do think it's a, a helpful prayer. Shortly after the Lord's Prayer, Jesus gives another example of a persistent neighbor. Someone comes to this, this person's house, and he has no feet, food to feed him, so he goes to his neighbor and knocks on the door in the middle of the night. He says, I have guests. I need some food. And the, and the neighbor says, I'm in bed. The kids are in bed. We're sleeping. Leave us alone. And he keeps knocking and knocking. He says, I, I have guests. I need some food. And what, eventually the guy gets out, you know, puts his robe on, his slippers on. He's like, here's some food. Are we persistent in our prayers? 
I think often we, we think, Lord, we've prayed this thing and you didn't give it to us. But if we actually look back and we realize we only prayed for it once. Be persistent. Perhaps you are being buffeted by the enemy because you lack persistence. Why do I keep getting attacked in this thing? Well, maybe because you've only prayed for it once. And then you've just relied on your own strength and ability. We should be persistent in our prayers. Paul instructs us not only to pray at all times and to pray all kinds of prayers and to be persistent, but then he says that we are to make supplication or, or pray for all of the saints. Much prayer time, to be honest, is focused on ourselves, isn't it? Here's what I need. We pray for our family. We pray for our difficulties. We pray for the, the, the things that we want in our lives. But, but God, speaking through Paul here, is calling us to pray for all of his people. We should be, look at, I mean, look around here. How often have you prayed for some of the people you see in this room? Do we pray for other Christians in, in St. Joe? Are we praying for other churches? Are we praying for, for you know, Christians just as they go about their life as, as businessmen or as teachers or as carpenters or as whatever it is their occupation is? Are, are we praying, Lord, help them to live out their faith in all of those things? Are we praying for brothers and sisters around the world? Perhaps you consider the difficulties of brothers and sisters who face trials and temptations simply because they fall under the name of Christ. And perhaps you've thought like, Lord, I think about the, the pain and suffering of maybe some of these Christian brothers and sisters around the world, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Pray. Just pray. Pray for them. Prayer is not a small thing. Prayer is powerful. It is, it's mighty. It can do great things. And, and we, we profess that with our mouth. But I think often we don't actually believe it. Because if we did, we would do it right away and don't. Sometimes we look and think of in other churches we've been part of or, or, or other people that we've known, and we, we, we sometimes look at maybe this unassuming older woman. We think, what can this 87-year-old woman do for the kingdom of God? But the reality is, is when God looks at that 87-year-old woman, He sees the worn warrior who has faithfully prayed for, for the people in her church or, or for brothers and sisters who are doing missionary work or for Christians who are around the world are, 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 are dealing with persecution. God sees in this 87-year-old, what we view, common woman, a warrior who is doing battle because she has consistently prayed God would Mighty things. God has a strategy for victory, and it's prayer. God's plan to move the kingdom forward is to use the strategy of prayer. I mean, look at this passage here. Look at verse 19. Paul says, and also for me, that words may be given to me to, to open my mouth boldly, to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. For I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Do you understand what, 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 what's being conveyed here in, in those two verses? Probably the greatest theologian of all time, the greatest missionary, the greatest evangelist, we might even say the greatest God-fearing man of all times is saying to the church of Ephesians, I need your prayers 
Because I can't do what God wants me to do unless you're praying for me. And, and if you read that, this again is where sometimes we've got to slow down and read that. Because if you see that and read that, you should sit back from your Bible and when you're done reading verse 20 and say, Are you kidding me? Paul, the great church planter, Paul, the great evangelist, needs prayer to be bold. The one who was like, takes a beating, the one who stands in front of governors and says, hold on, hold on, let me share something here. The one who is dragged in front of people and he stands up and he says, this is the gospel, this is the word of God, and they pick up stones and they stone him, and then they think he's dead and he gets up and what does he do? He walks into another town to do the same thing. He needs prayer? Yes. Be encouraged by that. Why? Why? Because when you think, I don't have the strength to do the things that God has called me to do, the strategy for you to do that is prayer. You should pray. I know what Paul was praying, but we should be praying for one another. I am so grateful when I, when I get a little text message for someone who says, hey, I'm praying for you, Pastor praying for the service today. Because I can't do this apart from prayer. And it's not just because I'm a pastor and I have to stand up here and do all these things. You can't do it apart from prayer. You can't live life apart from prayer. You can't do the task God has given you apart from prayer. So don't be stupid and think, I got this. You don't. It's, it's amazing that as you continue to read through scriptures, you just, you should be encouraged. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 80 years or 80 minutes. You have access to God. Pray. Pray that he would work in your life. Pray that he'd be working in the lives of brothers and sisters here in this church. Pray that his kingdom would be advancing as he strengthens us to do the thing that he has called us. You, Christian, cannot follow the commandment that God has given you to, to, to go and make disciples. You can't, you can't follow the, the, the command to, to be conformed into the image of Christ apart from prayer. We need to be praying, we need to be praying, we need to be praying. There's something here I also want to point out here real briefly before I move on to kind of the final observation that I have. And it's in verse 18, it says, pray at all times in the Spirit. And I just want to touch on that real briefly because what does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Some have defined praying in the Spirit to be this I don't know, ethereal, out-of-body enthusiastic, out of control, wash over you feeling where you're, you're kind of almost separated from yourself and you don't even know what you're praying. That the Spirit so controls you that you're so under His influence that you can't even comprehend the things that you're praying and it's just like, I don't even know what just happened. To put it gently, I believe that is an extreme misconception and a misunderstanding of the Word of God. If prayer is the means by which God has ordained us to communicate with Him, wouldn't He want us to know what we're communicating? I want to clarify something here. There are times I've prayed, and I know others of you have because you've shared things with me, where it's just like, I'm so overwhelmed, but I don't have the words. But, you know, there's that, that feeling of this, like, heartbreak or, 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 or even anger. And you're just, like, you're coming to the Lord, but you, you don't even know. Like, I'm not talking about that. Like, sometimes, yeah, I don't have words to say, but I, God knows what's going on in my heart and mind there. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people who are just like, I started praying, and then Stuff happened, and I can't even, I don't know anything. It's just like this out-of-body experience. That's not biblical. 
You never read about anybody in the scripture who says, amen, and then the next line of scripture says, I have no clue what just happened. You never see that. To pray in the Spirit is to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to pray according to the truths of the Scripture. To pray that His will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. To, to pray that you would be conformed into the image of Christ. All prayer that is God-honoring prayer is prayed in the Spirit. Because if the Spirit isn't in you, you don't want to honor God. So to put it simply, if you're praying rightly, like God-honoring prayers, guess what? You're praying in the Spirit. And how else do I come to that conclusion? Well, we have God the Father through Christ the Son by the Spirit. You see the chain here? It's, it's the indwelling Spirit that allows us to actually commune with God. So any communication with God is spirit prayer because it's by the spirit that you have been regenerated, if you will. It's by the spirit that the phone line, I know this is an old analogy here, is plugged in. For some of you younger folks, that used to be a reality, like phones got plugged in. There's one last thing I, I, I want to encourage us with. And it's this reality. Prayer is a wartime communication. I think the problem that we have with prayer and the reason we struggle with it is we have changed this, this strategy that was meant to be a wartime form of communication because life is war. We've got spiritual war happening at all times around us. And we've turned it into some sort of domesticated thing. We've turned prayer into a, into a bell that we, we ring so that the servant can come and, and give us what we desire. I'll let you in a little bit here on, on a secret about me. I really like Downton Abbey. And, you know, there's the, there's the servants, and every time they need a servant, they just pull on this little string, and then down in the servant's quarter, and you, you would, the, the, the bell for that room would ring, and they'd be like, oh, someone's in the study. And they would go up there, and they'd come through the secret hidden staircase into the study, and they would say, what do you need, master? Or what, how can I help you, sir or, or, or madam? And that's what we've turned prayer into. It's just like this, this, we pull on this string and that maybe somewhere up there in heaven, God will hear the bell and he'll come and say, oh, what is it that you need, Kurt? That's a wrong view of prayer. Perhaps you're familiar with, with Pastor John Piper. He describes prayer as a wartime walkie-talkie. It's something that you use to, to call headquarters so that you can hear from the commanding officer so that he could send in the artillery or the reinforcements to help you. Not to serve you, but to serve his army in the advancement of his kingdom. It's a long quote here, but I, I want to read this. Piper describes prayer this way. We cannot know what prayer is for until we know that life is war. Life is war. That's not all it is, but it is certainly that. Our weakness in prayer is largely to our neglect of this truth, the truth that life is war. Prayer is primarily a wartime walkie-talkie for the mission of the church as it advances against the power of darkness and unbelief. It's not surprising that prayer malfunctions when we try to make it a domestic intercom to call upstairs for more comfort then. God has given us prayer as a wartime walkie-talkie so that we can call headquarters for everything we need as the kingdom of Christ advances in the world. When you realize that we are at war, you will be on that walkie-talkie. Where is it that you want me to go? We need reinforcements. We need some help. We have some wounded soldiers. 
We need these things so that we can keep advancing forward. The purpose of prayer is to accomplish the mission. And we often ignore the greatest tool we have. You could focus all that you want on the armor of God if you ignore the strategy, this tool given to us so that the mission could be accomplished. You will fail. Don't ignore prayer. Paul is saying to the Ephesians and to us, you cut a radio to the commander-in-chief who has all the resources you could possibly need, and the reality is he actually enjoys giving them to you. If you're going to accomplish the mission that every Christian has been given by God, who is our king, We need to understand that prayer is the key to the strategy. You might even say prayer is the strategy. So let us heed the warnings of Christ to his disciples in Mark 14. It says, watch and pray. Not just watch. Watch and pray. Why? That you may not enter into temptation because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So keep our eyes open. We're at war. But pray in all things. Pray. God is listening. Pray. If we are praying, what we are doing is we are declaring that we trust God. We are declaring in our prayer, your will be done. Not ours. When we are praying, we're saying we are about the advancement of the kingdom of God, not the advancement of our own kingdom. Yes, put on the armor of God, but please don't forget the walkie-talkie. Pray. God is listening. Pray all the time. Pray for all things. And you might be surprised how mighty God works through prayer. Lord God, thank you. Thank you that you hear our words. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to not diminish prayer to something we just do as we recite the same thing as we sit before we devour a meal. I pray that we would be so enthralled with you that we would want to communicate with you so frequently in in all times, in all circumstances, that we know that you are so good and glorious that we would want your will done in our lives, that we pray that we would lay down our lives, that we pray that, that we would live for you instead of ourselves. Lord, forgive us. We don't think we need your strength and your guidance and your wisdom. Forgive us when we think we can handle things ourselves. Lord, I pray that you would stir in us a desire to know you more, a desire to commune with you. Let us celebrate the reality that you're inclined to hear the prayers of your people, that you according to the Old Testament, actually dine on our prayers, that you are satisfied by the prayers of your people. That you don't want sacrifice. You don't want a thousand bulls slaughtered, but instead you enjoy the fragrance of a contrite heart and the prayer of the lowly. So let us be people of prayer, Lord, because we have a God who delights in prayer. We have a God who has promised to hear our prayers. We have a God who has promised to give us what we need. So let us be a people of prayer. Let us delight in using the very strategy so that we would find victory as we pray. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. As we pray, that we would find the treasures at your right hand. In Jesus' name, amen.